there's a there's one time I was praying I don't think we'd been in this building very long if we were even in it yet and I don't know how if you're familiar with this but just sometimes your imagination the Lord uses your imagination and uh, call it a vision call it whatever but I was praying and I just saw this building from like a from the air <clears throat> And I saw all of West Savannah and all of Savannah. And out of this building, there was like this incense that was rising. It was like a fire and a uh, incense rising out of this warehouse on the west side of town. And um, we make a lot about prayer around here. We talk a lot about prayer. But I'm telling you, the Lord is doing a work in our hearts that will truly make us a house of prayer. And those words that we just sang, day and night, night and day, let incense rise. You realize that's what's happening in heaven? And as long as we're on this earth, we're to mirror what's happening in heaven. There, there's just a lot bubbling up in me for a series that's coming about how His presence changes everything and getting back to the main thing. And the main thing more than reaching this city for Jesus, the most important thing is being a place in this city where he's worshiped unceasingly from our lives, whatever we're doing, whether we're at school or on the job or whatever. But I, I just have a vision that will not let me go, that this building, this literal building is to be a place like that, where night and, night and day, Incense is rising to the Lord. Why? To reach people? No, because He's worth it. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. I don't know what you're going through right now, and you, you, you're just kind of overwhelmed. Well, if you're suffering for Christ, I, I felt specifically in worship, there's somebody in here that's like, you're catching some heat for walking with Jesus. I, I know some of you students are. It's worth it because he's worthy of it. I don't know anything about this, but Paul talks about this. And I've heard, I've heard people who are persecuted in other places for their faith, not just talked about. I'm talking about serious persecution. And they count it an honor to be counted with Jesus and his suffering. He's worthy of it. Can we just close our eyes for a minute? And I, I just want us to just open our hearts to the Lord. If there's anything in our hearts that says he's not worthy of this or that, or this would be, this would be too much, this would be too much of a cost, would you just allow him to reveal that area in your life? And could we just get honest with Jesus for a minute and say, Jesus, this is, my heart's not pure in this area. I don't really live like you're worth it. God, will you expose that in us? Holy Spirit, would you come in this room and restore us, God? Restore those areas of our lives. Lord, change our hearts to where you are worthy of it, Jesus. Would, would you just let that be your personal prayer to the Lord right now? Would you restore in me Whatever's broken that thinks you're not worthy. Would you restore in me a mindset, replace in me a mindset that says no matter what I'm going through for Jesus, he's worthy of it. He's worthy of the extra time. He's worthy of the sacrifice. He's worthy of everything. We really do love you, Jesus. I'll be the first to say I need your help. I need grace. It's a good thing that's who you are. You're a helper. You're full of grace and truth. And Lord, as, as we just center ourselves around your presence and who you are this morning, Lord, would you just change us? I think we've already started to be changed in your presence through worship. Would you change us through your word today? 
In Jesus' name, we pray. If that's your prayer, just say amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. We love you so much. I'm telling you, don't take, don't take for granted. You can be seated. Don't take for granted the people that lead us in worship. I'm just so thankful for you guys. Whew, okay, we got prayer rooms happening three times a week. Uh, you can check the, the website or church center app. Thank you, Tim, um, for those times. And also, Youth Sunday happens every first and third Sunday. This is not one of those Sundays, but it's happening next week. And uh, if you like hockey, who are my hockey people at in here? Uh, the students, the grades 6 through 12, they're going to a Ghost Pirates game on the 17th. You can register for that online um, at a discounted price of $15 a student. You heard about Parents' Night, March the 4th. Register for that if you've got, uh, got kids, if you're parents. It's going to be good. Um, I know we're in February, but how many know Easter's on its way? Have you been to Walgreens lately? They got all the stuff out already. That means we need to get with it, right? So, um, so something really cool that we're doing this year, um, being more intentional about this year, is we're not doing Easter for us. We want to do Easter for our community, okay? And so we're really making an effort uh, this year to get out of this building and go into our community, invite people, bless people. And so um, the outreach team has got this uh, thing going on where they're going to be canvassing and giving out Easter bags in our neighborhood right here in West Savannah. Um, there, we need uh, at least 20 people to actually go out into the community and deliver the bags and personal invites. But we also need people to make the bags. And so if you're interested in that, where you at, Chuck? He left. Well, Chuck, you know Chuck, he was singing right here, <laughs> right? Go see him or Shay or Jamin or anybody in the outreach team. And, or you can reach out online through the contact form and say, hey, I want to help with Easter. What can I do? And we'll get, get back with you. Um, Christian, come on up. Communities are kicking off this week. <laughs> Christian, tell us a little bit about, about communities. Good morning. How are you guys? Like, uh, like Gunnar said, my name is Christian. If we haven't met, um, then, then nice to meet you. Um, we, uh, I get to help out a little bit with communities around here, and I just wanted to jump up just really quickly and remind everybody that communities do start next week. Come on, if you're excited about communities, that's happening next week. If you're a little bit newer to the dwelling, um, if you're a little bit newer to the dwelling, then, uh, then community groups is something that is a big part of our house. It's a big part of what we do. We actually believe that the way the church is moving, the direction it's headed in, it looks smaller. That actually over the next few decades, the church experience will look a little bit less like big rooms, less and less like conferences, less and less like concerts. Not that those things are bad by any means, like there's so much fruit that's been injected into the church from those things, and we love those things, but it's just that we feel the Lord is moving in a new direction with this church. And that direction looks a little bit more like reclining at a table with people, having a meal, sharing in conversations, actually becoming a part of people's lives on the day to day and the week to week. And so that's where we're headed with our community groups. That's what we believe as a church. And a couple, a couple of ways to sign up for that. I'm going to give you three real fast. If, do we still have the QR code? Yes. One way is you have until I'm done talking to scan this QR code. Sign up for groups. Second way would be to go to our website homepage. There's a link on there to sign up for a group. Um, you can also, my favorite way, the most fun way, I think, is to find a community group leader, which you can identify because they're wearing one of these right here. Find one of those guys, and they'll help you sign up for community groups. We've got groups all over the city, so there's, there has to be one near you unless you live in like, I don't know, like an hour and a half from here. Like there's a group near you. Find a group, jump in, and um, I'll, I'll uh, introduce some of our community group leaders really quickly. And we'll bring my phone so I don't miss anybody. But we've got a few. So Ardsley Park community. That is Stephen, Ansley, Josh, and Amy. We've got a downtown community, and that is Catherine and Mitchell. We've got a Wilmington Island community, and that's Dan, Amanda, George, and Gretchen. 
We've got one of our pooler groups, and that's going to be Josiah and Emily. We have Southside Community, and that's Chris and Patty. We have a Windsor Forest Community, and that's Taylor, James, Ashley, and Leo. Come on. We've got a West Savannah community that's actually meeting right here at the church, and that's going to be Chuck, Shay, Delinda, and Michael. And then we've got one more old pooler community, and that's going to be Jason, Brandy, Nate, and Nicole. Come on. These are community group leaders, guys. Find one of them. Jump into a community group. We really, really feel like where the Lord is taking us as a church this is how we're going to get there. So, yeah, I encourage you guys to jump in. I'm going to hand it back over to Gunnar for our series. Thank you. All right, just, just for clarification, old pooler doesn't mean just old people in pooler. It means the older part of pooler. Someone's like, old pooler? What is that? <laughs> oh, that's my community. Some of y'all are like, oh, old pooler. All right, we're, we're continuing our series this morning called One. Everybody say One. Jesus has not just called us to unity, he's called us to oneness. He prayed in the garden in John chapter 17, he says, my prayer is not just for them alone, talking about his disciples that he poured three and a half years into, but he says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their message. That's you and me, right? He says that all of them may be one, one. Just as you, and the, uh, you are in me and I am in you, Father, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so unity is, uh, more often than not, it's centered around agreement. But oneness is about covenant. It's about even if we disagree, we're family. And that's what the body of Christ is about. And that may be uncomfortable. That may be, uh, what, is, what, is that, what does that do to my boundaries in my life? Well, you should still have boundaries but I think we need to start moving toward oneness and not be so individualistic and like me and Jesus. That never was the idea that Jesus had for his church. That we're supposed to be one together, one in him, one with each other. Oneness, not just unity. So that's his plan A. And becoming one is achieved through living out the one another's in scripture. And we're diving into some of those one another's. And today we're going to talk about honoring one another, but I'm curious how many uh, how many uh, competitive people do we have in the room? Yeah. Or my compet? Go ahead. See who was first to raise their hand. Okay, so so how many super like hyper competitive people do I have in the room? Exactly. Now we're gonna have a wrestling match right here, and I'm just kidding. Here's how you know if you're hyper competitive. How many family nights have you ruined? Family game nights have you ruined? That's a good litmus test. If you can't play Uno without it going south real quick, you're a hyper competitive person. How many has played spoons before? You ever made anybody bleed? That's who I'm, you're who I'm talking to, okay? So. This will be good for you. This will be fun because today we're talking about outdoing one another in honor. It's not just honor one another. I love this. It's like, make it crazy. Like, go a little overboard with it. Like, outdo each other in honor. Romans 12, verse 10 says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. So what is honor? What is honor? Let's look at what the Bible says about honor, because I could tell you all day, but there's a lot of references in Scripture to honor. One of them is in Romans 12, 10, like I said. Another one is Exodus 20, verse 12. This will be familiar to you. Honor, honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Um, how many know we never outgrow that command? Even if you're, if you're a middle schooler in here, a high schooler, Honor your father and mother. If your mo mother and father are still alive and you're an adult, honor your mother and father. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, a passage in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. I'm just going to read the whole thing. It says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except that which God has established. 
let that sink in for a minute. Think of the context of Corinth here, these are Rome in, in Rome that they're talking about. The, the, the Roman Empire, very pagan. It's not like it's a Christian nation, right? And you've got Christians trying to walk out this life with Jesus in an, in an atmosphere that's pretty dangerous to them. It's actually, um, it's coming against them constantly. And, and, and walking with Jesus doesn't go with the grain. It's very much against the grain. It might even cost you your life to walk with Jesus. And this, this is the context of this. But he says, honor the ones in authority. He's not talking about just in the church. He's talking about in the government authority as well. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That doesn't sit well with me. Does it you? So just let it not sit well for a minute. That's what you do with the Bible, by the way. You don't just take that out. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against God and what he's instituted. And those who do will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. It's supposed to be, right? But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, then pay your taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Honor is a way of life. It just doesn't happen in the church house. It happens in culture around us. Everywhere we are, we ought to be outdoing one another in love. I mean, in honor. How about this one? 1 Timothy 5.17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are well worthy of double honor, especially those who work as preaching and teaching. I'm just kidding. That's an awkward. That's more awkward for me to read to you than it is to you for you to hear from me. I promise. So, uh, let me just take a moment, and let's give some context around this. Okay. If you're in leadership, and you ever hold that over somebody's head, you don't need to be in leadership. Honor is not something to be wrung out of somebody. It's not something to manipulate anybody with. It's not something to get something out of somebody with. Honor is freely given. Honor is beautiful. Um, that's all I'll say about that. Let's define some terms. I love this definition of honor. I've used it for years now. Honor is this. It's recognizing and affirming the value of a person. It's recognizing and affirming the value of a person. I love this quote by Bill Johnson. He says, honor is celebrating a person for who they are without stumbling over who they're not. See, we honor people not based on how they honor us, not based on what they believe, not, not based on whether they're a believer in Jesus or not, or how far they are on this, or where they are on the political spectrum. It doesn't matter. We honor people because that's the command. We love people because that's the command. That's like this, the first one. The second one's like the first one. Love God with everything. Love people. I mean, it's the second most important thing ever in Jesus' estimation. And what does love look like? It looks like honor. That's one expression. And so God ascribes value to people, and honor affirms that value. Does that make sense? So God has said every person on the planet is valuable because they're made in the image of God. My responsibility is to honor that, affirm that with the way I treat people. So what gives a person value is not what they bring to the table, 
It's not what they can do for you or me. It's not what they've achieved. It's not their social status. It's not their color. It's not their race, their sex, their gender. It's not even their sexual preference. Honor is freely given. Why? Because people are valuable. And when I honor someone, even when I disagree with them, I'm actually affirming what God says about that person. God ascribes value, honor affirms it. So, respect and trust are earned things, right? I mean, like, you can lose respect for somebody. They just lie to you and lie to you and lie to you, or they treat you bad. You know, it's like, you, it's hard to respect a person. But no matter how bad a person has hurt me, I can still honor them. Yeah. And that feels really wrong. But here's what I'm honoring, the image of God in them. Yeah. And the most jacked up person on the planet is made in the image of God. The person on the extreme end of the political spectrum that you are on was made in the image of God. The person you work with that's just downright ugly to you was made in the image of God. And I might not can affirm everything that they do, but I can affirm their value because they're made in the image of God. Maybe a good practice, people that you have a hard time loving, I've, I've found this. I actually gave somebody this advice earlier in the week, and I, I heard it from someone. But this person was being maligned by an individual, and they said that thing came up of like, oh, that just, that hurts, and I don't like that person, you know, because of what they say it, said about me. And this person said, actually, what I did was I began to see them as a toddler, and it's like, if we could just rewind the clock to where we could see some innocence and feel the way God feels about that little one, that helps me. That helps me a lot to forgive people because I realize that sometimes you start here and by the time you're grown, life has done a number on you. And sometimes hurt people are the people who hurt people. And, and, and so not to excuse anybody's behavior, but we're all broken and we all live in a sinful world and stuff's been done to us. And maybe that's the way people, why people act the way they do. But what I, all I'm saying is look beyond outside and behavior and all that and honor the image of God in them. Not, not because you get anything out of it, just because God values them. If we are not just made in the image of God, but called to be imagers as a verb, to being intentional about imaging and demonstrating what Jesus is like to the world around us, we ought to value people. We ought to honor people, right? All right. So what honor is not? Let's talk about that a little bit, okay? First of all, I hinted at this a moment ago. Honor is affirming the value of a person. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to affirm that person's values. Because we live in a culture where a, a personal opinion and values of morality are all over the board, right? Because that's what happens when you remove truth. When you remove a standard of truth, then th everything's up for grabs. And that's just the culture we live in. That's where we find ourselves. Um, someone on this side of the room may think something's wrong and this person doesn't. Why? Because I just feel that way. There's no standard of truth anymore because we've removed the Bible. I'm feeling a little sassy. But I feel a little pushback from that because we're, we're learning from culture instead of Jesus. Being a disciple, what Christian was talking about a while ago, it's going to be progressively harder and harder to walk with Jesus and to be a spectator in the church and to be someone who just kind of sits on the outside and watches things happen and to be a casual Christian in this culture. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to do so. 
It doesn't matter what happens in the election this year. It's going to get harder and harder and harder to do so. And we got to get serious about this stuff because we can walk. This is what we got to learn to do. We've got to learn to walk in conviction and stand for what's right, but stand in love. This is what the church has really jacked up is that we've said, well, this is what's true, and we're going to stand on it, and we're going to stand on your neck and your head and stomp you in the ground because you believe this way. That's not the gospel. That's not the heart of God. That's not Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and truth. We got to get out of the ditches, and we got to ride on that road of, of tension with Jesus. That road where, where, where you can be, you know, you can be right and wrong at the same time. You can. You can have all the right answers, all the right theology, and you can be a total jerk. And it, what it actually does is it undermines what you're saying by the way that you say it. I told you I'm feeling sassy. But am I not telling the truth? I'm telling the truth. I'm not trying to be sassy. I'm just, I'm telling you, we've got to learn If we're demonstrating Jesus, if the world will know what Jesus is like because of the way we live, we got to treat each other better. Stand on your convictions. Stand firm and don't, don't, don't back an inch on what's right. Stand up for truth. Open your mouth, but do it in love. Do it in love and show it in love. So honor is not flattery. Just because somebody publicly honor somebody doesn't mean that they're flattering that person. Sometimes we call things flattery because we're insecure. Have you ever noticed that? We're like, well, he just kind of goes on about so-and-so all the time and he'll never say anything about me. That, that's insecurity and pride. So honor is not that. It's not flattery. We don't, we don't honor somebody to get something out of them. If, if the only reason we honor our superiors and our job is to get a promotion, we've missed the heart of it, yeah, right? Honor is not transactional, therefore. It's not, it's not this thing of, well, if I honor him, then he'll honor me, and then, you know, we'll work this thing out. Everybody wins, right? No, you just love and you honor. It doesn't matter if they honor you back. I'm glad Jesus honored and loved me before (laughs) without asking me what I thought or looking at my jacked up life before he loved me and hung on the cross for me. That's what he calls us to, that kind of radical stuff. I mean, this doesn't make sense to a lot of folks, you know? Like some of this is rubbing us the wrong way and we're in the church. (laughs) Like we got to get back to it. Honor is not... Ignorance, and this is, this is a passion of my heart right now because I see many, many things happen in the church, especially over the last few years where we've seen leaders fall, we've seen churches crumble, we've seen all kind of bad stuff. And a lot of people are walking away from the church because of that stuff. That's just the honest truth. But honor is not ignorance. It's not pretending that we don't see something It's not pretending that leaders are perfect. There's a dangerous application of honor in the church that has has covered sin and abuse. Physical, emotional, spiritual abuse. And has been silent because, oh no, we got to honor. We got to honor. And we use, we use David's word, don't touch God's anointed. If we see abuse happening, you have to say something. You do not stay silent when people are being hurt and call that honor. That's the antithesis of honor. I don't know what you call that, but it's not honor. It's ugly. It's bad. We've seen plenty of that, and we see what happens when that happens. Covering up sin is not honor. We've sometimes acted as if, it's, as if honor is never confrontational. I'm the least confrontational person ever. 
I promise. I know it didn't sound like it this morning, but I really am. I hate it, man. I hate having hard conversations. I hate when you're not happy with me. I hate that. But I'm going to tell you something. I can't say I'm honoring you if I'm not telling you the truth. And you can't say that you're honoring me if you're not willing to go out of your way to get uncomfortable and have a conversation with me. If I've hurt you or if I'm doing something stupid, if it, I'll tell you this, if I start acting a fool, my wife's going to call, call me on it before any of y'all do. I mean, she called me on my outfit this morning. She said, we're going farming today? I just need JD's Bass Pro hat, and I'll be good. <laughs> Honor doesn't excuse leaders from accountability just because they're leaders. It doesn't matter if you're a leader or not. Honor doesn't excuse us from accountability. Let's quit using that as an, as an excuse. Let's quit using that as a deflective weapon against people. Somebody told me a, a story not long ago where people just being ugly to each other and nobody was calling the leaders on it. And it was like, oh no, we got to honor the leaders. And then if you did say something, well, hey, where's your honor? This is a culture of honor here. That's manipulative. That's not right. Uh, Y'all ain't never seen me this sassy, have you? If you lead people, that's my word today. I, I regret the whole shoddy comment last week. No, it's sassy. If you lead people, a really good idea for your growth, for your integrity, and for your character is to surround yourself with people who don't tell you yes all the time. I mean, this goes for anybody, whether you're leadership or not. Find you some people who don't care what you think. Don't think so highly of you that they've got you on a pedestal that they can never speak into your life. Don't put yourself there. Uh, I'll just tell you this, in case you're wondering. We got some elders in this church. They'll do that for me. I believe it. I've had conversations. Dane, Dane Ray is a bulldog. <laughs> He's a tender and humble man, but he ain't going to skirt around with nobody. And Stefan Cote won't either. And their wives won't do that. And Adam and Andrea, she ain't going to skirt around, is she? she did. I just, I'm so thankful for that. Do you have people in your life that'll tell you the truth, that love you? I'm not saying let people abuse you and all that kind of stuff. Get out of that. Mm, but don't run from accountability. And call it spiritual abuse or whatever. Don't, don't, don't run from that and then find yourself off alienated and isolated so the enemy can come peck you off. You ever notice the, the Discovery, you watch the Discovery Channel? You know, the ones that the, the leopard gets are the ones that are off by themselves. The ones that are hurt too. But they've, they've, they've been isolated. They've been, they're off over here away from the herd and their perfect target. Don't let offense isolate you. Don't let uh, an inability to be confronted about your own life isolate you. It's a dangerous thing. It really is. So culture of honor is a beautiful thing when it's done right. Oh, man, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. But it can also be dangerous. I heard a... Uh, I heard a story recently. Is Baxter here? Yeah. Hey, I'm reading Outliers. He, he said, you need to read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm Gladwell, one of his books, uh, Tipping Points, out there on the shelf. Grab that. If you have not read that, grab that when you leave. I can't vouch for everything in there, but I love that book. Um, but Outliers, he tells a story about, and I won't name the country, just not being sensitive and everything, but, um, but there's an airline in a certain country. And this country, this culture in this nation was just hyper honor culture, right? So um, 
But what, what they found was, this is back in the 70s, is that this particular airline had the most crashes of any other airline in existence. And so they're like, why? Like, what is causing this? So they, they went into, well, there's not the plane. Like, is it the training? Is it, what is this? And they, they pinpointed a few things through their investigation. But one of the primary things was the culture that the pilots were bringing into the cockpit. And here's what I mean by that. Their culture of honor was so high that a co-pilot would not even dream of correcting the pilot or questioning the pilot's decision or anything like that. And so what would happen is the pilot hadn't slept in 14 hours. He's not thinking real, real straight. And the person sitting next to him who knows what's happening and knows that, hey, this, ain't, this is not a good situation, would never say anything. And if they did, it was just little hints. And they were listening to the cockpit recordings. And they're like, how could you not grab the thing? How could you not confront? And that's why. Because a culture of honor is a beautiful thing, but it can also crash everything. And so we've got to, it's that both and walk. Again, it's the tension. It's the yes, we love people. Yes, we honor people. But we better keep our honor in check. And just because, just because uh, somebody is in leadership or just because somebody is this or has this status or this title or whatever, listen, we just got to keep that in check and quit using flattery to get our own promotions and stuff. All right. So let's get practical as we close. Man, I'm getting done so early today. If honor is how we tangibly affirm the value of people, then here's a few questions to consider. Because, you know, we can talk about honor theoretically. We can take a 30,000-foot view, which I think we kind of have this morning, of just like, what is honor? But if it doesn't show up practically in our lives, it doesn't matter, right? And so what does honor look like for me? What does honor look like for you? What does honor look like in relationships to one another? So here's some questions. Just practically today, in some of the stories that I've told, in some of the verses that we've read from Scripture, probably what's happened in the room is that you've had some ideas about some people that you've dishonored. You might have had some ideas about some people that have dishonored you, and you kind of just, even as I've been talking, you kind of, Rehearsing those things, conversations. You can't really control what they do, but you can control how you respond. And, and if you've dishonored anybody, Holy Spirit, show us right now. Go get that right. Don't walk around with that, with that weight on you, right? If you've dishonored somebody, take initiative. And show them honor. And sometimes that looks like having a difficult conversation. Yeah. And if you're like me, I want to avoid it at all costs. But if I'm going to be, be obedient to Jesus, I got I to gotta open my mouth. I got to talk. I got to say something, right? Yeah. Speaking the truth in love is the command. So husbands, how can we honor our wives? A conversation, I'm just going to let y'all into our living room, okay? Is that all right? Can y'all handle that? Um, conversation around the dinner table, actually, last night. Um, a member of my family said, sometimes it seems like daddy's not listening to me. By the way, a culture of honor allows things like conversations for like to take place. How dare you? You know, there's none of that. Right? That's fear and control when we do that. Nobody feels like they say anything. Shaking in my boots. We've tried to do that. <laughs> I feel like some of it's corrective. Like, you parents, you're just scared to death, and you're, like, trying to just make everything happen, and now we're like, oh, <laughs> we can't control anybody. <laughs> Let's try to change this thing, you know? But, Yeah. My, one of my kids said, I feel like sometimes you're really 
interested in what I'm saying? It seems like you are. And then 10 minutes later, when I ask you about what I was talking about, you have no idea what I said. And I was like, oof. It's the ADHD. That's what it is. Right? I could find all the excuses in the book. But how can we honor our kids? Sometimes it's just being a better listener. And I'm just telling you, that's what I'm working on, especially after last night. I want to be a good listener. I, I, I want to be a good listener to, to my family. I want, to be, um, I want to be a good listener to you guys. You know, none of us are Superman or Superwoman. Like, we can't remember every conversation we've ever had and all that. But, man, we can be intentional. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, I'm really bad at this. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Because I've got to answer this. But I'm face-to-face -face with you. How do you feel? You feel awful. I probably did that to somebody this morning. I know I did it, Christian, because I was trying to answer somebody else. Sorry, Christian. Um, how can we honor our kids? How can we honor our wives, guys? Ladies, how can we honor our husbands? And I'm asking you these questions because I want you to think about it. And I'm just trusting the Holy Spirit to just download an idea into your brain right now that you can do something practical. I will say this, and maybe I'm talking to the ladies, maybe I'm talking to everybody, but one of the things about honor is it expects the best of people. I'm just going it, it believes the best. So who have you written off? Honor looks like rethinking about that situation, rethinking that person. And honoring them no matter what they've done. I'm not saying let them in, no boundaries, all that stuff. If they've hurt you, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying you can honor. Okay. So a practical action you can take today to show honor to someone in your life. What is that? Can I close by honoring some people in the room? I just want to like practically do it. And I'll challenge you to do it before you leave today. There's somebody in this room that you would not be who you are if they had not come into your life. Somebody told me that the other day. Somebody standing right over here. And, and, and as a younger, a younger lady in the faith, and there was an older lady in the faith standing over here. And she said, I'm going to tell you something. If it weren't for that woman right there. We got people like that in our lives. Have you told them how much you appreciate that? Have you, have you honored them, not just privately, but publicly? Because it's got to be both. You got to do both because private, you know, that, that's good. But public's on another level. But if you just do it publicly, not privately, that kind of looks shady. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I'll just say publicly about Leah. I sent you a text. We had a text conversation this week. And I said to you, you know what I appreciate about you is that you're always wanting to grow. Like you're always, you're never thinking, I'm, I've arrived, you know. You're always like, I'm talking like it's passionate pursuit of growth. Like I want to get better. I want to get better and better. And I just appreciate that you, about that, about you, appreciate that about you so much because a lot of people are satisfied. You're not satisfied. And man, it, it puts a drive in me when I see that in you. So, and people need to know how hard you work. People need to know how much you love these students at this church. And we're thankful for you. And I just want to honor you. Yeah, give her give some honor. Now, I can't honor everybody in the room, okay? So don't get your feelings hurt. I'm just kind of going with a moment right here. Like, Nate's bail, man. Sitting back here in this sound booth, making the QR codes come up so perfectly this morning. My scripture's on point. No, man, I, I just, I think about you and I think about just long faithfulness. I think about just how faithful you are to your wife, to your family, how you do your job well.
how you serve well. Uh, not many of you know, if you're, if you're relatively new, when we moved into this place, it was a little bit of a hot mess. And, and, <laughs> and Nate and Christina pretty much kind of led that whole thing of like renovation at the, yeah. at the beginning. And just up here to like 10 o'clock at night some nights, nobody knew. Nate's up here nailing baseboards in at 10 o'clock. Everybody's asleep. Nobody knows what's happening. I just want to honor you for that. Yeah. I want to honor you that, yeah. I just want to, I want to honor you for being this stability. Yeah. Like I've seen you, I've seen you broken over circumstances that have happened. I've seen you in stress. And you're just solid. And you're always looking like you're, you're, you're the kind of a person who can see things analytically and like, oh, we need to fix this. This isn't right. You know, you're very, you're very excellence focused on, some, on things, but you're not negative. I've never, ever heard Nate Spell say anything bad about anybody. I've never heard you say a sour word toward anybody. Behind their backs, to their face, nothing. That's a big deal. I can't see most of you. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just say this, Rachel West. You have, you have a heart for prayer that doesn't care what anybody knows about it. Uh, I've seen you come up here and sit on this platform and there'd be zero people in the room and Jesus is here and that's all that matters. And I'm telling you, you are, man, you are, you are sowing for yourself friendship and intimacy with the Lord deeper than you can even imagine. And I know you know what you're doing, but it's, it's, it pleases his heart more than you could ever know. Matt Fajardo's not here, but I've seen him do the same thing right by his little self. I love you, Lord. It's a good thing he loves the Lord because that's <laughs> the Lord's here, you know. I, I pulled it. We got a camera in that that little corner right there, and I pulled it up just sometime. He's in here, right by himself. But that's what it's about. David was out in the field doing that right by himself, and that's how he became David. So I just honor that. Man, there's so many. I'm like, who can I pick? I don't want to waste your day. <laughs> Chase, you see people. You see people. You got a tenderness about you and a disarming personality. That just when you walk in the room, everybody's like, oh, glad he's here. You know, yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. You can say things, and I would even challenge this. Like, it's okay to say things that are conf confrontational and that need to, need to be said because people will listen to you. Yeah. They'll listen to you when you say it. I honor you for that. All right, let's all stand. That's fun. I just... I could do that all day. <laughs> and I'm not doing that to get anything out of anybody in this room. Isn't that freeing? Yeah. When you don't feel like you've got to make something happen, you could just honor and love people. Would you find somebody to, today to do that to? You will? Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus for showing us what honor looks like. Mm. Thank you for taking a basin and a towel and washing your friend's feet that night. And thank you for how you've taken that same approach with us time and time again when we didn't deserve it. Thank you for washing our feet, Jesus. 
Lord, help, help us to have a heart like that. Help us to honor people and love people well like you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You, have a God, you guys have a great week. Communities kick off next Sunday. So get in a community if you're not in one. Love you guys.